Now for chapter 11. In this chapter, we're going to talk about all different ways um, gene expression is regulated. Um, and we'll, we'll talk first about how it gets regulated at the DNA level. Then we'll move on to what happens if we can control RNA stability. Maybe we can control how the um, proteins get translated. And then finally, the lifetime of the protein can be controlled. All of this will regulate whether we have an active protein in the cytoplasm or in an organelle to do its job. Um, although our main um, emphasis seems to always be eukaryotes in our class, um, two systems were figured out in prokaryotes or bacteria that are the best place to start with um, for regulating gene expression. And I'm going to jump ahead to this slide here. Um, I'm going to skip the virus discussion that's in your textbook. It focuses on HIV and a few other um, other background ideas. We'll talk a lot about viruses in a chapter when we do immunology and I'd prefer to wait to talk about that stuff until later and we may not get into the detail that they have at the beginning of this chapter. Um, so read it, enjoy it, it's very well done but we'll go back to um, virus replication in the uh, end of March, April. So, onward. We're going to focus first on the bacterial system called operons, and these, this is a system that's going to look at the way we can regulate some enzyme activity in that cell. So, um, this is just a schematic to remind you that if you have a system where maybe here's a precursor molecule that's going to be acted on by an enzyme to turn into something, A, then an enzyme will work on that to turn it into B, and then so on to finally get an end product. We talked about this kind of stuff in the fall. Might remind you a little bit almost of glycolysis. Excuse me, glycolysis. So um, there's ways to regulate whether you're going to make that end product. One way would be to have that product come back and allosterically inhibit the enzyme. Remember we talked about turning enzymes off. That's what happens in glycolysis. Um, but what if you don't want to waste the energy of making any of these enzymes because it costs a lot of energy for the cell to turn a gene into a protein? And then you might want to regulate the um, pathway by actually turning off the making or the, um, the production of these genes into mRNA and then finally into protein. And that's where we're going to focus our, our work right now. So again, remember this is only in bacteria. E. coli Escherichia coli is sort of the lab rat of bacteria. Very easy to grow. We'll be growing some in the lab in a couple weeks. Um, this is, there are two operons we're going to talk about. We're going to talk first about the lactose operon or the LAC operon, it's abbreviated. Um, this is an inducible operon. The second operon we're going to talk about is the tryptophan operon. We'll get to the details of that in a second. And that one is a repressible operon. One thing to remember is that this system of operons where these genes, here they're denoted as Z, Y, and A, are all under the same control of one promoter, only happens in bacteria. This system in eukaryotes would be a little different that each of the genes would have its own promoter to control it. And again, we're going to do that for the second half of this chapter. So first, let's immerse ourselves in the LAC operon. So the LAC operon consists of this continuous stretch of DNA. That's what this line is, DNA. And we're focusing now on three genes here, the Z, Y, and the A gene. These genes have a role in the bacteria being able to first, um, here it is, permease, bring um, stuff into the cell to cleave the lactose and then also modify the lactose. So what is lactose? Let's get into our background. Lactose is a sugar. Lactose is a sugar that we find in milk. So let's come up with a scenario of why you would ever want to um, use um, something to act on your lactose. Remember, lactose is a dimer. I don't know if you remember it, but I'm going to tell you. And lactose is a dimer of galactose and glucose. So what these enzymes do, beta-galactosidase right here, this guy, is cleave the bond between galactose and glucose. Why would you want to do that? Well, if lactose is in around these cells, they need to use that glucose for energy. So the lac operon basically is made to cleave lactose into usable parts so that the cell can get some energy from glucose. If you remember that, it might help you um, understand how this operon works. 
So if there's no lactose in the system, if that bacteria is not, um, these bacteria live in your stomach actually. So if you have not had any milk in your diet and you stay away from it, then maybe you don't need to be cleaving these and you don't have to bother making these three enzymes that will help the bacteria cleave the uh, lactose into galactose and glucose. So don't do it. So basically the, the kind of general off state of this operon is to not be making any of these mRNAs. Instead it's an inducible operon. So in the presence of lactose we're going to do something to allow this gene to be, these genes to be made. So how is it going to happen? So here's the two scenarios that we're going to work on and we'll look at them in, in more detail. First when lactose is absent and then when lactose is present. So let's get the lactose is absent picture up. So again, here's our genes. The light blue ones are the mRNAs, are the genes for the mRNAs that we want to make. Again, we're looking at the DNA. When there is no lactose here, this guy here, who's called a repressor, is active. So a repressor is a protein. This is a protein that has, the, has an affinity for this particular part of the DNA called the operator. The O stands for operator. That's where I should have my pen out, but I'm not going to. O stands for operator. So the operator is a region of the DNA where the repressor protein binds. If there is no lactose in the system, this protein likes to bind the DNA and it blocks the RNA polymerase. So this is RNA polymerase that wants to come in here normally and bind the promoter. That's what that P stands for. And if it could bind, it would make these genes. No lactose. The repressor is active. It binds. We don't make it. It just is a roadblock. Okay, so what happens if you have a whole bunch of ice cream and you've got lactose in your system? Well, of course, nothing in biology is ever easy. So it's not actually lactose that binds our repressor to inactivate it. It's an a, a isomer of lactose called allolactose. So allolactose can bind our repressor protein and turn it off. Here it's crossing his legs and he doesn't know how to bind the RNA or the DNA. If that repressor falls off, RNA polymerase can bind the promoter and it can make these genes into mRNA mRNA gets turned into the proteins and now we can cleave our lactose and have glucose. That's it. That's all you're doing. So presence of lactose allows the RNA polymerase to bind because the repressor falls off. Okay, so you're going to go back and listen to this again and take notes on it, but I'm just going to zoom through. The next one is the TRIP operon. So this is an operon which controls the genes, and I guess I'm going to zoom in on this one because it'll be easier. These are um, five proteins, enzymes, that are needed to make tryptophan. So this is kind of resembling that slide that we had back here in the beginning, here, where I said that there were five enzymes to make an end product. Let's substitute tryptophan as your end product here and some precursor X in the beginning. So if you have not been eating lots of meat and you have not been bringing a lot of amino acids into your diet so that your stomach, uh, protein so that your stomach can digest them, your bacteria in your stomach do not have a lot of proteins around. Therefore, they need to make these enzymes to make tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid. If you don't get enough in your diet, you have bacteria there to make it for you. So you want to have these enzymes going when there is no tryptophan in the system. If there is lots of tryptophan in the system, we don't want to make these genes into proteins because that would be wasting our energy because we'd get plenty of tryptophan around just by digesting our food and having the amino acids around. Okay, so in that case, tryptophan is a repressible system. If there is tryptophan in the system, we want to shut this down. That's over here. If there is no tryptophan in the system, we want to make the genes. Okay, so let's dissect that a little more carefully. So again, there is um, a protein called the repressor. That's actually coded for by a gene right up here, and they're showing you that that is a gene made from the DNA. So that repressor is hanging around. In the absence of tryptophan, our repressor is inactive. This is opposite the LAC. Always messes people up. Okay, no tryptophan, no repressor binding. DNA plum RNA polymerase combine the operator, or um, combine the promoter, and it goes and it makes the genes that go into mRNA that codes for the enzymes to make tryptophan. You make tryptophan. What happens if you have tryptophan in your diet? So the co-repressor, or the guy that activates the repressor protein, is actually the tryptophan. So you have some hamburgers, you digest up all the proteins, you have lots of amino acids floating around. 
Bacteria has lots of tryptophan. It binds the repressor protein, changes the shape of the repressor, and now it's active. The repressor binds the operator region, which is adjacent to the promoter. This blocks the binding of RNA polymerase. You don't make the genes. So again, tryptophan, the tripopron is a repressible system. <clears throat> In the presence of tryptophan, you turn it off. <clears throat> we have a worksheet so that you can read about this, think about this, look at some animations of this, and work through it. But basically, um, I find that if you think about what these genes are doing and why they're there, you can understand the difference between this repressible system for tryptophan or the other one, the inducible prep system for um, the lactose. I think this will be the beginning of the next section, which where we talk about the eukaryotic gene expression. So tune in for that next. <laughs>